It had been less than 55 years since the Norman conquest of England by William the Conqueror. William's fourth son, King Henry I, had been king for 20 of those years by the autumn of 1120. King Henry was a prolific sire, fathering over 20 children. Unfortunately, most of them were illegitimate. Only two were born from his first marriage to Matilda of Scotland. The first, born in 1102, was a daughter, also named Matilda, followed by a son known as William Adelon a year later. Some contemporaries described William Adelon to be pampered, though this may have been an unfair assessment as he was an untried boy of 17. He was adored by his father as the king's sole heir. William's full-blooded sister, Matilda, had been sent to Germany as a young girl to be raised in the household of her first husband, Holy Roman Emperor Henry V. Matilda had been crowned Empress in 1116, so it is unlikely that William knew her well. William enjoyed a closer relationship with many of his half-siblings and other kinsmen, including Stephen of Blois, the son of his father's sister. William was young, but had started to prove himself as a warrior, having fought at his father's side in the Battle of Remuel in 1119. It was now the 25th of November, 1120. William, who was styled the Duke of Normandy, and his household accompanied his father at Barthol Harbour. The pair were due to sail home for England. Among the party were William's half-siblings, Richard of Lincoln, and Matilda Fitzroy, Countess of Perche, as well as William's cousin, Stephen of Blois. In Barfleur, the royal party encountered a man named Thomas Fitzstephen. Fitzstephen was the captain of the White Ship, which was a fast and newly constructed vessel. Fitzstephen's father had been the captain of the ship which had brought William the Conqueror to England during his invasion a generation earlier. Fitzstephen thought it would be a nice gesture to offer to ferry the royal party across the English Channel. The state-of-the-art white ship appealed to the teenage William, and he was given permission to remain behind and make his return to England on the white ship a few hours later. Captain Fitzstephen's crew had requested large amounts of wine as provisions for the voyage, and the prince had happily obliged. Perhaps he supplied too many libations, because the crew was binge drinking heavily enough that it was said that Stephen of Blois and several others disembarked out of concerns for their safety. Others claimed that Stephen had actually suffered intestinal distress, causing him to catch a later ship. Either way, history would have been altered had the prince followed Stephen's lead, or asked the captain to wait until the morning when the crew would be sober to sail to England. Instead, perhaps bolstered by the impetuousness of youth, William seems to have encouraged the jovial atmosphere. It may be that he trusted the skill and reputation of the crew. Perhaps he wanted to impress his friends and courtier. Unfortunately for William, and for England, it would prove to be a fatal error in judgment. The drinking continued until night had fallen over Barfleur Harbor. Inebriated, and perhaps in awe of his noble passengers, Captain Fitzstephen was urged to catch up to King Henry's ship, which had left hours earlier. Between the darkness of the night and the impairment of the crew, the white ship struck a rock on her port side, while still in the harbor, and the state-of-the-art ship began to sink. William had managed to get into a lifeboat and likely would have survived had he not turned back in an attempt to rescue his half-sister, the Countess of Perche, when he heard her cries for help. His lifeboat was swarmed by passengers and crew who had fallen overboard and were desperate to save themselves. Tragically, William's boat was overturned and he drowned. The magnitude of the tragedy was immediately apparent to Captain Fitzstephen, who somehow survived the initial sinking. When he realized that his royal patron had not survived, Fitzstephen deliberately drowned himself rather than face the king with the devastating news. Of the nearly 300 souls aboard the white ship that night, only one, a butcher from Rouen, survived. Back in England, none at court had the courage to tell the king of his heir's fate, nor the fate of his other children aboard the doomed ship. 
They instead chose a young boy who was told to cry in front of the king, and when he was asked what was wrong, he was to tell the king of the shipwreck. Thus, the devastating news was told to the king. Henry fell to the floor in anguish, so great was his shock and sorrow. Henry was so debilitated that he had to be helped to his chambers by several friends where he was able to mourn in privacy. King Henry dutifully married again in the spring of the following year in a futile effort to produce another male heir. William Adelon's death would have a long-lasting impact on the kingdom, plunging England into a period known as the Anarchy, which I will explore in the next installment of this series. Regardless of the political impact of William's death, the king's personal grief was immense. It was said that after the sinking of the white ship, Henry never smiled again.